The keynote address was given by Professor Sayed Hussein Nasser, University Professor of Islamic Studies at George Washington University. He began with the observation that this conference was one of the most important ever held on traditionalist topics. Professor Nasser's talk was titled, The Recovery of the Sacred, Tradition and Perennialism in the Contemporary World. He presented a survey of the influences of modernism and scientism in the contemporary world and pointed out a number of significant ways in which the traditionalist perspective has been contributing to a more truthful assessment of that world. Dr. Nasser's talk also helped those attendees unfamiliar with this perspective to understand some useful terminology and central traditionalist tenets. Since this is the opening talk in this conference, uh, Mr. Lakhani asked me to cover generally the field of tr tradition, and so I chose for my talk recovery of the sacred tradition and perennialism in the contemporary world. So let me go back very, very quickly to basic definitions. I'm glad Mr. Lakhani spoke a few minutes about the meaning of tradition itself. Let me add that this word gained its particular meaning at a time when the West had already become inundated in almost all of its aspects by an ideology called modernism. And to distinguish traditional truth, that is how human beings had thought and lived according to divine dictum, before this event, it was necessary to use a particular term. And the term tradition was used rather than religion because religion itself at that time was looked upon, especially in continental Europe, in a pejorative way for, by many people, and it itself had, had become, to a large extent, influenced by modernism. And therefore, the late René Guénon, followed by Ananda Kumar Swami and Friedhof Schwann, the three great masters of the traditional school, used the word tradition in this particular sense. But let's come back to the basic understanding that tradition means the sacred and its continuation over temporal sequence within a particular civilization. So it implies both the sacred origin and the continuation of the teachings which are sacred and which involve art, thought, life, every different aspect of our existence here on earth. Then we have the term traditional. Uh, of course, that's very easy and the way we use it uh, is the person who accepts uh, or who looks upon an idea which has the color of tradition. As for traditionalist, we use this for those who have totally accepted the traditional point of view. There's no one on earth, including atheistic philosophers, who do not say something sometime which has a partial truth in it. There, nothing would exist without partial truth. Uh, and therefore, that not, does not make tradition. A traditionalist is a person who accepts the traditional point of view, who accepts tradition as defined, which embraces the whole of life. Finally, we have the term traditionalism, which unfortunately, despite the excellent book of uh, Professor Olmedo, who must be here somewhere on the, with this very title, has also gained a pejorative connotation, especially in France and Italy, because a number of people have come about, in fact, in fact they came about a long time ago, who took the teachings of Guénon as being a kind of philosophy called traditionalism, as if it were another religion, as if it were another revelation. And therefore, certain authors, including the late Dr. Martin Lings, wrote specifically against the dangers of using traditionalism in this way. But I think for this conference, we must accept its positive and very positive connotation that is an the ism with which we're so much used, which incorporates the truth and the teachings of tradition. A word, short word also about uh, perennialism. While the traditional school was very strong in Europe, the term perennialism was not very much used. The term perennialism came to be used in conjunction with tradition, especially in North America, and to some extent in Great Britain, but especially in North America, and today it's very prevalent. And again, it's very important to distinguish between the understanding of traditionalists of the perennial philosophy, and as this term is used in a general sense by many people, this term became popularized by Aldous Huxley, a British novelist, 
uh, in the 1940s, and since then has been used a great deal. Yes, we who consider ourselves to be followers of tradition all believe in the perennial philosophy, but our understanding of it is traditional, not a kind of general conceptual unity between various ideas from different civilizations without a root in sacred revelations and without an aspect, a praxis, a practice. And I think it's very important to keep these terms in mind at the beginning of this very important two-day conference. Now, at the heart of tradition stands the sacred, with the capital S. The sacred, metaphysically, is that which is totally itself, independent of any other reality, therefore absolute, and encompassing every reality that is infinite. These are attributes of the divine, of the divine ultimate reality. So the sacred is really another way of speaking about the divine. The reason we use the sacred is that it also flows into human life in such a way that it gives meaning to human life that is palpable. You can all smell the perfume of the sacred. Uh, Friedrich Schoen always used to say that one of the characteristics of modern man is that he has lost his sense of smell of the sacred, the perfume of the sacred he no longer smells. And so I always want to come back to this idea of the sacred, about which I've written a great deal for during the last few decades. And of course, other traditionalist writers, especially Friedrich Schwann, paid a great deal of attention to this term. Uh, this is also of many, uh, of course, derivatives with which I will not dis uh, get, uh, become entangled right now. So the origin of tradition is the sacred. Sacred with the capital S. And tradition, which is related, of course, to the word for transmission uh, in English, is the transmission of that sacred presence down the road within various civilizations, which we therefore call traditional. And within them, there are arts, there are sciences, there are philosophies, there are social structures, practically every aspect of life, including the political and economic, which have the perfume of the sacred, which are related in their structure to archetypal realities issuing from the divine source, from the sacred with the capital S. Now, let's make something very clear, which uh, Prince of Wales also alluded to, but it needs to be very much clarified. I've read, even in the page of Sacred Web during the last year, certain people writing uh, who have made a mistake as to why it is that we honor the past. We traditionalists honor the past. Traditionalism does not only have to do with the past. We do not honor the French Revolution and the guillotining of heads uh, uh, because it happened to be in the past. We honor a past which was imbued with the presence of the sacred. And that is why we are defenders of traditional societies and whatever remains of it. Not because it is in the past, but because it was in the past, but because it was a past in which the sacred was present. And this is a very important issue that must be understood. But tradition does not only concern itself with the past, it concerns itself with an ever-present reality here and now. A statement which I made many decades ago in London, which has been uh, uttered by many other people, I said there is nothing more timely than the timeless. And this is certainly true of tradition. Tradition is timeless, and by virtue of that is timely. The truths of tradition are not proven by their crystallizations in the past. They are proven, especially for traditionalists, by the metaphysical evidence here and now, by the possibility of the experience and the intellectual understanding of the principles of tradition as we live right now at the present moment. And to this is related of the idea that many people have brought up that certainly there was evil in society's past, and we traditionalists idealize the past. Now, this is a remarkable assertion considering the fact that so much has been written by traditionalists about evils of the past. 
First of all, which past are we talking about? If you go back to Hindu cosmology, uh, uh, certainly we're not talking about the Krita Yuga or uh, the Golden Age. We're talking about pasts, which are oftentimes in the Kali Yuga itself, if you're going to use a Hindu term. And in non-Hindu terms, no traditionalist has denied that there was evil, let's say, in the European Middle Ages or the Islamic Middle Ages or uh, in ancient Egypt or whatever it is. The fact is that's very important to understand, however, is that for traditionalists, even evil has a religious meaning. That is, there is sacralization of the understanding of even evil. Not that there was no evil, but that this evil was understood in light of the principles of the manifestation of the sacred, which does not mean that everywhere there's only goodness, the separation from God entails separation from the good, and therefore the shadow of what we call evil. What the traditionalists insist upon is that evil cannot be reduced to social elements alone, to bad social engineering, to negative economic conditions, or to psychologization. They consider evil itself as being related to the manifestation of the sacred. And therefore, this accusation made often that we idealize the past and overlook evils of the past is totally fallacious, and no traditionalist worth his salt has ever said such a thing. Now, let me turn to the role of tradition and perennialism in our world today. In a world which, by and large, has lost its sense of the sacred, but this world is not the whole world. We must start by understanding that not the whole world has become anti-traditional. That tradition still survives in various degrees, on various levels in certain parts of the world. In other parts, it has become more or less completely eclipsed. But wherever modernism has spread, and all of this dominating paradigm which dominates over the rest of the world through military and economic power, and now has been accepted by many parts of the world. In that, within that paradigm, there's a loss of the sense of the sacred. Uh, but the nostalgia and the thirst for the sacred has not been lost. And that is the secret of so many pseudo-religions, and also serious attempts to discover the sacred outside of the matrix and limitations of the civilization which has created modernism, and therefore the great serious interest also in non-Western traditions. But the goal right now, more than anything else for tradition, is to rediscover the sacred in various domains. And I want to enumerate them for you. First of all, pure metaphysics, knowledge. Pure knowledge, knowledge of the divine principle is sacred by nature. Uh, and it is the heart of knowledge itself, the, the very substance of knowledge. In one of his most amazing phrases, in which he was such a master, uh, Frido Schwann said, and I will quote this in French because it is so beautiful in French, the English isn't quite as good. Uh, he said, la connaissance de la substance et la substance de la connaissance that is knowledge of the divine substance is the substance of knowledge itself. And the highest goal of tradition is the rediscovery of pure metaphysics. That is the supreme science, the science of the sacred with the capital S, which by virtue of that is itself sacred science. That's why I oftentimes use the word scientia sacra, as certain other traditionalists have used. This is the science of the real with a capital R. And the discovery of the sacred on every other domain depends ultimately on the rediscovery of the science. It is not accidental that the three great masters of the school of tradition in the 20th century, Genon, Kumaraswamy, and Shuan, were all remarkable metaphysicians, each in his own way. They were all great metaphysicians because of the primacy of supreme knowledge which itself gives us a vision of reality from the highest reality to the simple re everyday reality in which we live. 
And therefore, tradition has set out for itself the duty of reviving a supreme knowledge which had been lost in the West for a long, long time. As Guénon said already almost 100 years ago, what, what is called metaphysics in Western philosophy is not really metaphysics. And in fact, the term metaphysics itself is very unfortunate because it makes you think of something meta out there and is a name simply given historically to the book of Aristotle, which was read after the physics. So it was called metaphysica and it stuck. In other traditions such as Islam or Hinduism, there are terms which are much more direct, like the term for ma'rifa, term ma'rifa in Arabic or janana in Sanskrit and other terms, which deals with wisdom directly. But we, are, we have no choice but to use the term metaphysics in the English language, and remember that by that we do not mean simply a branch of philosophy, what we mean the supreme science which transcends all discursive philosophy and traditional philosophy itself, in a sense derives from that pure metaphysics and leads back to it. Now in this task, which is a momentous task, of the rediscovery of sacred knowledge, the traditional schools has been very successful. Compare the intellectual landscape today to a century ago, 1906, in the West. I don't mean in India or Iran or places like that, but in the West. Compare the two. In 1906, the philosophical intellectual landscape was totally dominated by either rationalism or irrationalism after Kierkegaard and coming of this kind of philosophy in the late 19th century and the mainstream rationalism going back to Hegel and Kant and those people. In that scene, the only island, you might say, of separation from the sea of rationalism and anti-rationalism were these occultist circles in Europe, especially continental Europe, but to some extent in England, who would looking in for some kind of a a divine knowledge, some kind of a theosophia in its original Latin sense and as used in German after Martin Luther and ended up with modern theosophical movements and Annie Besant and Madame Blavatsky and all kinds of things like that. But there was no serious metaphysics to be learned at that time. Now a century later, you first of all have the remarkable books of these great metaphysicians, which are in print and read. And you have a number, I don't say everyone, a number of European even philosophers who are influenced by them, the least being the Anglo-Saxon world, where logical positivism and analytical philosophy has sort of dominated like an octopus over philosophy departments. But in continental Europe, there are now more and more openings to at least the consideration of uh, the perennial philosophy or pure metaphysics. And in America, things are changing very much. It's paradoxical that the, the Second Congress on Tradition skipped over no, uh, the United States uh, from Peru to Canada, uh, where the one country where there's most need of discussing tradition uh, because of the tremendous power that this society has for the destruction of tradition, wherever it goes. Uh, but at the same time, there's a great deal of interest now in the United States. I remember that when I first came, this is a kind of anecdotal account, to this country, one day Houston Smith, who was a very old friend and a perennialist and traditionalist, I don't know whether he's here or not, he called me up, I was then living in Boston. He said, please come to New York immediately. The American Academy of Religion has accepted to have a session on the perennial philosophy and tradition. And you have to address them. So I took the plane and went down to New York and the room was absolutely packed, and that was the beginning of a kind of academic acceptance of the perennial philosophy, which has gone from strength to strength during the last 25 years. Unfortunately, even in America, there is a greater opening. So in this task of representing traditional metaphysics in a contemporary language, which would be understood by the Western intelligentsia, of course, prior primarily French and English, but also German, Italian, uh, Spanish, other European languages, major European languages. Uh, the traditional school has been very, very successful and has rendered a service which is invisible to many, but which is extremely important. 
The second is the recovery of the sacred in the cosmos. This is a vast subject, uh, which happens to be something about which I know a little bit, and I would have liked to spend a great deal of time with you on this, but I have to be very brief because everything has to be said. Uh, the cosmos was always considered to be the domain of the sacred in every traditional civilization. The Hindu cosmos, the Islamic cosmos, the Taoist cosmos, the ancient Egyptian cosmos, Native American description of the cosmos are impregnated with the sense of the sacred. It was 17th century Galilean and Cartesian and Newtonian science that deprived the cosmos of its sacred quality and in fact made the statement that the cosmos is sacred or nature is sacred a meaningless statement scientifically. And that's how it remains to this very day. People who speak in these terms are considered to be poets or philosophers or mystics, but irrelevant to serious knowledge, which we call science. That's one of the greatest tragedies that befell humanity and which is going to destroy us all. Now, what has to be done, and this here the task is more difficult than in metaphysics, is to revive the sacred understanding of the cosmos and of nature. The reason it's so difficult is because Western civilization and its domination over the rest of the globe for the moment is based not only on science but a kind of scientism without people being fully aware of it, in which the views of modern science concerning the cosmos, which are perfectly legitimate as long as they remain within the boundaries set for modern science, are taken to be the only possible description of the cosmos, the only serious understanding one can have of the universe. And therefore, we live in a world in which a pseudo-cosmology, I will call it, based on the extrapolation of, of physics and astrophysics, has created this vast universe of stars banging against each other, and we are irrelevant to this whole reality, and we're just a speck on a speck on a speck of dust in that vast cosmos. It's really just science fiction, really, but it's taken seriously as science, and I never take it seriously because it changes every 10 years. Just wait 10 years, and this whole thing will change, and something else will come about. It just needs a bit of patience. In this world, there is no place for consciousness. There is no place for a reality which is not energy or matter defined according to modern physics. Just a couple of years ago at Harvard University, I gave a lecture called, in the beginning, it was consciousness. Uh, the oldest philosophical lecture that exists in this country, the Dudley Lecture, and uh, it caused a great deal of stir because I said that there that, in fact, the cosmos begins with consciousness. Consciousness does not evolve gradually within the history of the cosmos according to one of the most important pseudo-religious ideologies of the modern world, which is evolutionism, which every single traditionist has opposed for a thousand and one reasons into which I will go now. I will not go now. But what has helped the cause of reviving the sacred in nature is the breakup of the world, the environmental crisis, which in the 60s was understood by only a few people. And now we have Vice President Al Gore's film, Inconvenient Truth. Uh, so uh, this has become an urgent matter and very, the very circumstances which have created this unprecedented precedented crisis in the history of humanity helps to rediscover the sacred aspect of nature. It's interesting that in many circles, the only part of our teachings which are of interest to people are those which have to do with the question of the environmental crisis, with the question of nature's theophany, and the so-called New Age religions have taken a great deal from traditional writings on this particular issue. The New Age religions are not to be confused, of course, with tradition, but then we have to rediscover the sacred in us, in man. It's amazing how human beings have been able to secularize themselves, that is to apply to the human state a pseudo-scientific view of the nature of man which will reduce man simply to the molecular structures and DNA uh, structures in his sinews and bones, which reduces the spirit 
to the psyche, the psyche to biological uh, activity and the biology to physics. Uh, of course, every tradition has been based on the realization of the sacred reality of the human state. When I say man, I mean homo in Latin or anthropos in Greek and not only the male, that is men and women, the insan in Arabic. There's no tradition which has not believed that we have descended, that we have not ascended, we have descended. Whether well, it's a doctrine of Purusha and the sacrifice of Purusha and the son of Kamel or the fall of Adam from paradise and, and the Garden of Eden and Christianity and many, many other uh, examples. Some traditions like Confucianism do not talk about the origin of the cosmos son of man. So there's not that question, but the cosmic dimension of man, of course, so-called the anthropocosmic uh, doctrine, which Tu Wei Ming speaks about, is very evident. But for other traditions, there's always the doctrine that we have descended from a perfect archetype. That is the foundation of all ethics. If we have ascended, why should we be good? That's a very important philosophical question. And the religions meet very easily in the understanding of the sacred nature of the human state because we have ascended, not but descended from an archetype. Uh, we talk all the time today about the sacredness of human life. If somebody runs somebody over, it goes into prison. If he murders somebody, he might even become uh, himself condemned to death. This statement, sacredness of human life, is pure sentimentality, totally devoid of any foundation in the dominant worldview that of, what, of modern civilization. Because if human beings are nothing more than molecules which simply are banged against each other a bit more than in the case of the, the trilobites of the Cambrian era, then what is sacred about it? It's just sheer sentimentality. For tradition, the sacredness of human life is not a sentimentality. The divine, which is the source of all that is sacred, has breathed his spirit unto us, as the Quran would say, and parallel views of other traditions that there is a divine spark within all of us, that at the center of our heart resides Atman, the divine self, and many, many other descriptions of it. And it's that which makes human life sacred. The fact that we walk vertically, which itself a miracle, we don't pay attention to it. How can we do this with two little feet walk like this? Uh, is a remarkable matter, uh, is a symbol of the element of verticality in the human state. That is, we were born to represent the sacred in this world and to live in this world in such a way as to return to the sacred. And therefore, what Islam calls, calls our khilafah, our vicegerency, that is being the vicegerent of God here on earth with all the responsibility that that entails. I wish I had more time to talk about this matter, but one of the most important services which traditional writings have rendered, I believe, is in providing the deepest intellectual and scholarly critique of so-called human evolution. And this has been done from many, many points of view, many dimensions, and some leading biologists in Europe who are not at all traditionalists, who are scientists, have drawn from these arguments uh, and I've had a lot of contact as far as uh, that goes, so I will not burden you with examples. Close related to this is the rediscovery of sacred history. Now, there are those who reduce religion to its history. That is one of the tragedies of studying religion today in Western universities. You never study anything, you only study its history. And therefore, relativizing all the truth of religion to historical manifestations. Of course, the traditional point of view is totally ahistorical from that point of view. But it also emphasizes sacred history. It emphasizes Krishna and the gopis, and Abraham and his sacrifice, and what these mean in different sacred histories, which end up with eschatological events, of which the perennial philosophy and tradition are very much aware. Very, very much aware. In fact, one of the most important elements of the doctrine of tradition at the beginning 
was a discussion of cosmic cycles, of the coming to end of the world after, at the end of the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, to which also the Prince of Wales referred, and uh, ideas in various religions about eschatology. Now, I have a some, few important comments to make about this, which touches our life right here as we sit in this auditorium. First of all, we have some traditionalists who are a bit too much Kali Yuga experts. You know, who sort of look around all the time to find this sign and that sign, and this is against the spiritual attitude and uh, belief in God's freedom and God's will, and uh, it's a detriment to the spiritual life. I do not want to emphasize that, but we must have the general understanding that we are living in a world in which higher possibilities have been exhausted, strange uh, possibilities which seem to be impossible manifest themselves, but in which still there is the freedom inwardly of believing in the truth and reaching the truth. What the traditionalist point of view can do right now is to answer this very, very dangerous, politicized, politicized, excuse me, eschatology in, on the Christian right in America and not appearing in the Islamic world and in India, in three different parts of the world, not so much in Europe. That is, first of all, this purely exclusivist eschatology, which has been developed by many evangelicals in which they believe that if you become an evangelical, Christ will raise you before, before, without death to the other world through rapture, and the rest of us will burn in the fire of hell, including Catholics and Episcopalians and others, not only Muslims and Jews and Hindus. This exclusivist eschatology is one of the most negative forces politically in the world today, and it needs to be answered from the point of view of the perennial wisdom uh, of all religions, which first of all, all stated that you cannot force the hand of God. These things that some of these evangelicals say that we have to do this and that to force Christ to come down on earth is really of the blasphemy of the worst kind uh, against Christ and against God. And also this idea of Mahdiism, which is its correlative in the Islamic world, which now has some followers, including in Iran, is also very dangerous uh, for the same reason although not as politically potent as the first. And also the coming of Kali Avatar among certain extremist Hindus and the things they do, uh, all of these go together. Uh, the perennial philosophy has a, an aspect devoted to eschatology, which is the end of sacred history. And I think that's a very important role that tradition can play in the world today in setting the record straight uh, and showing why the prophet of Islam said, everyone who predicts the coming of the hour is a liar. This is a direct hadith of the prophet of Islam. Then we come to the social order. It's in this order that most of the sacred structures which were created in traditional civilizations have been destroyed in the last few year, centuries in the West to a lesser extent in other civilizations, but everywhere where not traditional structures have been weakened. Let's start with the family. One of the traditional authors once wrote that the three major institutions that God gave to humanity directly, uh, prophecy, monarchy, and the family, which governed the life of traditional societies in archaic days and old days, two of them are more or less gone. That is prophecy, and uh, or revelation and monarchy. I mean, the two still survive here and there, but they don't have the central role. The family remains, but for that very reason, it's attacked from all sides. And uh, the, the traditional point of view, first of all, shows both the absoluteness and the relativity of family. It, sh it shows that in, in a certain tradition, you can have monogamy. In certain traditions, you can have polygamy. You can have all kinds of marriages. Now, of course, some people would say you have self, same-sex marriage, but that doesn't exist in any traditional text. But anyway, that there are, there are different ways of envisaging the family, but the family structure itself is sacrosanct and has a sacred quality to it. Secondly, what the Hindus call caste, which we do not have in, let's say, Islamic Christian civilization, but we do have the types, the primordial 
profound human types which correspond to the Brahmanic or Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, the famous Hindu castes, but there are certain people who are drawn to knowledge. Is that what that makes them happy? Even many modern scientists are by nature Brahmanic. Certain people do not become happy in knowing. Others do so. Certain people become happy in performing noble acts. And there are the Kshatriyas and so forth and so on down the road. What tradition needs to do, and has done to a large extent, is to bring out the spiritual significance of these social structures. Uh, I don't think no work in this domain has been as important as the book Casta Ras by Friedrich Schuon and some of the works in Swedish by Tag Lindbom, much of which has not been translated into English. And this also includes political institutions. This is a very touchy and ticklish matter because the traditionalists have been defenders by definition of all traditional political institutions that have survived. That is, they would side with the Ch Japanese em emperor against Mao Zedong, just uh, to take two extreme cases of two sister civilizations. And of course, some pl places it does not work well. They've been criticized for saying you've had some bad kings, uh, uh, therefore uh, succeeded by good presidents, and they give the case of Farouk and Jamal Abdel Nasser. But the traditionalists would say, I will quote here, Friedrich of Schwann, he said, the worst king is better than the best president because the king represents an archetype, a sacred archetype which has manifested itself in human history, uh, whereas the president does not. Now, these are relative matters, I said. They're very sensitive, and one cannot apply them completely because there are so many different circumstances in the world in which we live. But in principle, uh, the traditional point of view has tried to bring out also the sacred nature of the inst political institutions that dominated over sacred civilizations, going back to ancient Egypt, Pharaonic Egypt, and ancient Babylonia, and coming down to our own days. Now, turning to another domain, very different, uh, where tradition, like in metaphysics, has had a great deal of impact is in the revival of the sense of the sacred in art, including music. Western art developed in such a way gradually as to go from the sacred art of the Middle Ages, the incredible cathedral of Chartres, or the sculpture and paintings of the 13th and 14th century, to a kind of religious art, but gradually becoming divorced from sacred art uh, during the Renaissance, and some of the paintings like that of Botticelli and Raphael are, have a great deal of human beauty, so it's difficult to see the transition, to finally modernized art from the 18th century onward, from the naturalism of the 18th century to Impressionism, Expressionism, and finally the dissolution of forms of Western art. And the idea that you have sacred art was very, very difficult to establish in the West. This was the yeoman service that Ananda Kumaraswamy and Titus Burkhardt, more than anyone else, uh, performed for both Hindu and Islamic and, and also to Christian art to a large extent, and also the incredible writings of Friedrich Schoen on this. And to this is closely related the idea of the relation between beauty and the sacred. And this is a domain in which, among all the traditional writers, Schoen was especially very, very much interested and wrote very important texts. That is, what you might call the love of beauty is ultimately the love for the sacred. And here, beauty does not mean a kind of a decadent attract, uh, uh, object or form that attracts the passionate soul, but beauty as a spiritual quality which always attracts the higher elements of the soul and attracts, in a sense, the soul to heaven. Beauty is something which pulls us up because God ultimately is beauty, as the Hadith of the Prophet says. He's not only beautiful, but he is beauty. God, the divine reality, is beauty as such. And therefore, to make people understand that beauty is related to the sacred, to our final ends, to our deepest needs, is one of the very important accomplishments of the traditional school and what has to be con continuously emphasized. Because we live in a world which considers beauty to be luxury and have nothing to do with use, with utility. 
Whereas from the traditional point of view, beauty is like the air which you and I are breathing right now. It is not a luxury. If we don't breathe this air, we die. In the same way, when souls no longer breathe beauty, they die spiritually. And that is why all traditional civilizations had created such beautiful ambiences. I mean, just think of Kyoto, or Isfahan, or Fez, or Chartres, or uh, ancient Beijing before modernization, all different civilizations, Benares, uh, the smaller Hindu cities, some of which have survived in the south, all of these still to be, despite everything, something of the beauty of the traditional world. There is no traditional civilization without beauty. There is no traditional metaphysics without beauty. It is not accidental that the greatest expressions of metaphysics, east and west, have been combined with poetry all the way from the Upanishads, which of course sacred scripture, and the Quran, which is sacred scripture, to human writings like the Divine Comedy of Dante, sermons of Meister Eckhart, which is their poetry or very poetic. And you have hundreds of instances of this in Islamic and Hindu and Buddhist sources. I will not burden you with that. And finally, the role of the sacred today is within religion itself. Because religion should be the source of the sacred. The religion begins with the sacred. So how can tradition, as we see it, play a role within religion itself? In two ways. First of all, much of religion, especially Western religions, and since the 19th century, more and more non-Western religions, have themselves become modernized, sometimes without a full awareness of it. And tradition has had for its role to criticize that within religion, which itself has turned against the traditional understanding of the sacred. A prime example of it is Teilhard de Chardin, the Catholic priest who tried to Christianize evolution and who believed that Christ was not the Alpha, it was only the Omega, as if the Omega could be anything but the Alpha, and that the world evolves towards Christ. It doesn't begin with Christ, it begins with slime. Uh, and this was criticized very severely by the late Titus Burkhardt, by Schuon, by many others when the ideas first came out, and then many people in Italy and so forth took that over. Uh, so there is a critique of the modernism within religion itself, which tradition provides. I've done that oftentimes within the Islamic world. I don't give myself the permission to do that for the Christian world. I think Hindus should write for Hinduism and Christians for Christianity. It's very hard to jump over and write for another religion. Uh, but the great masters like Shuan have done that, in fact, for Christian and Hindu modernisms of the late 19th century and 20th century. The second point that tradition plays a very important role is to bring out once again the hidden dimension of religion, what they call the esoteric, which simply means the inward. People are, do not like esoteric because of the misuse of the word esotericism in French and English at the beginning of the 20th century. But we just simply mean the inward, the inward dimension. Ezo in Greek simply means in. The inward dimension of religion, which is associated with mysticism in Christianity, with Sufism, with esoteric schools of Hinduism, with Zen and Shin and Shingon and all kinds of different schools in the Far East, Chan. Uh, and to bring the, out the reality of these inner dimensions, especially in the West, where the inner dimension of Christianity has become eclipsed for centuries, to revive that and on the basis of that show the inner unity of religions. And here is the great significance of the present, for the present day of the tr traditional teachings, that is you do not have to posit orthodoxy against universality. The more orthodox a person is in the true sense of the word, the more universal that person is. And this battle between the uh, hardliners of different religions in the name of preserving their orthodoxies is a great tragedy based on the forgetting of the inner meaning of their traditions. Now, the highest goal of tradition, tradition school, is not to, uh, to revive all these things that I said outwardly. It is to enable us to revive the sacred within ourselves. Once we revive the sacred within ourselves, the sense of smell of the sacred comes back to our nose. The olfactory sense is revived. 
and we are then able to see and to smell and to hear the sacred wherever it be. And therefore, one of the elements of the tradition which I wish to emphasize, which many people have forgotten, even within the traditional world, is the necessity of spiritual practice within an orthodox cadre in order to really be traditional. It is not accidental that both Guénon and Chouan wrote so many pages about this matter. And Chouan especially emphasized not only the theoretical understanding of metaphysics, but the living of it. One has to live the truth, and one cannot do that by oneself. One has to have a spiritual teacher, one has to have a card, or one has to have spiritual practice. Now, to conclude, the intellectual and spiritual uh, function of the traditional critique of the modern world is very, very important. Many people have asked me, why is it that you people criticize all the time? Why can't you just state the truth as you see it? Why are you so critical of modernism? The reason is, first of all, it's impossible to state the truth while error reigns. It's impossible to build a building on a ground when there's another building there. So this destruction of modernism is not a negative thing. It is to prepare the ground for the expression of the truth, a perennial truth, the wisdom of the ages, which tradition is concerned with. And therefore, there's both an intellectual and spiritual function to this critique. Many a person who has had an inkling of the understanding of the perennial truth has been swayed by the waves of error which surround us away from that position. Uh, what we have to do is to be able to, cre to create uh, an ambience uh, which will enable us to be traditional and to not to wake up one morning and say, well, God, all of this seems like an illusion because the world around me presents me with something else. The practice of the sacred and the critique of the modern world are very, very important for keeping alive the traditional perspective. And all of this, as I said, requires more than words. It requires deeds. And beyond deeds, it requires being. It requires ro rooting our existence in the ocean of being, and even non-being, which transcends being. The traditional perspective provides a means to think correctly. Once I asked Friedrich Schwann, what do you think is the most important reason that you write? He said to provide a way for th people to think correctly. Not the, all the doctrines, but to think correctly. That's which many of us have forgotten. To create an intellectual space within which metaphysics and traditional cosmology, anthropology, and doctrine of art, aesthetics, and so forth has a reality. To create a spiritual space within which spiritual discipline is meaningful. It is not like a dream, uh, which somehow is evanescent, is something that becomes concrete and we can cling to. And to provide this message of the harmony between religions and various human collectivities, which is of the greatest importance for the human state today. But above all, of course, the purpose of tradition is to serve the truth. For when all is said and done, error disappears and the truth remains. Thank you.